welcome back to season four of my podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood. As many of you know, I wrote my autobiography as a survivor of human trafficking. It's called Custom Justice, but if you didn't know that, you do now. Keeping in line with that, the last season and this entire next season are all going to be focused on interviewing people who did or plan to write about their own experiences as trauma survivors and how they overcame the past. And as much as we all hate commercials, they are a necessary evil these days. That's what keeps the show on the air. You know, you can also show your support by purchasing one of my many books or donating through PayPal or leaving a review on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on. You can find the links to the books or for donation options in the podcast description. And as always, a portion of the proceeds do go to local organizations that help fight human trafficking. Hey folks, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, This is Amanda Blackwood, your host as always, and I have a a fantastic person with me today. Her name is Donna Tashjan, and Donna has uh, quite the story to be able to share with you guys, and I'm going to leave it up to her as I usually do because she's going to tell the story better than I would anyway. Uh, (laughs) Donna, welcome to the show. Thank you, Amanda. It is a pleasure to be here today. Donna, where are you originally from? Well, that's a really good question. When you move about every two years of your childhood, you don't really know where you're from. Um, Even. <laughs> but majority of it, I grew up in Southern states. So I say I'm a Southern girl. That's the way it feels. Um, and I ended up marrying someone from upstate New York, but I never said I was a New Yorker. I just didn't. <laughs> You know, that's interesting. My mother was originally from Arkansas and she married uh, somebody from upstate New York. Maybe there's something to the old opposites attract thing. I don't know. Um, (laughs) I, uh, it was really a different culture. That is for sure. And so learning um, how to adapt to all that is another story for another day. (laughs) Yeah. Talk about culture shock. In the United States, you would not think it would be that much, but it was. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. When I moved to Los Angeles years ago, I moved there. Population of 163 people. I totally get the culture shock thing. (laughs) (laughs) It's scary. Oh, so tell us a little bit about uh, the trauma that you had to uh, go through that kind of led you down the path that you're on now. Um, there was a lot of stuff building up to this. Um, I grew up in a blended family. Um, and it's interesting, you know, when you blend families, I was the oldest child prior to that. And now I'm the middle child, um, but still treated like the oldest in some ways. So it was an interesting dynamic in trying to make all of that work, um, big trying to keep everybody happy and be a good girl. Can you relate to that at all? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, so anyway, um, so around, I get, it was 14 years old when someone close to our family, I, the way I say it is they hurt me and I became pregnant. Um, it wasn't a consensual situation and I grew up in the, uh, So the social times was, it did not matter why you were pregnant. It just wasn't okay. Um, This is before internet. I know a lot of you listening may not relate to that, but there are a few of us that (laughs) do do remember before cell phones and before internets. And when our phone was hooked to the wall. (laughs) (laughs) Right. I had a rotary dial. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Rotary and party lines. I've had party lines too. So yeah, most people, a lot of people listening may not know what that is, but um, so why I say that is because when you are isolated and you don't have any of that, you are isolated. Um, And so I did not have uh, friends or anything like that. And I became a mother at the age of 15. Um, I did raise my little girl. Wow. It was a blessing that came out of the, all of that. 
Um, I finished high school before I was 16, before I was 17. I was full-time employed before I was 18, and I had my own place shortly after that. Um, so, you know, I say all of those accomplishments, but what was behind all of that is I've got to prove everybody <laughs> that they're wrong. I've got to prove something to the world. And man, that's a rough way to live. But it, it propelled me to do things to not be a statistic. And um, anyway, that's part of my story. <laughs> Tell me what you mean about needing to prove somebody wrong, needing to prove the world wrong. They're saying that you can't do it, so you've got to do it. Yep. I mean, I kind of walked the same road myself. I grew up being told that I was ugly and stupid, so I mm -hmm. went to college for physics and modeled for Harley Day. Mm -hmm. I do these things because I wanted to do them. I did right. them because exactly. I had a mission. Mm -hmm. Yep. So how do you feel like your trauma has impacted your life kind of in the long term? I know you've got a gorgeous daughter out of it. <laughs> uh, it, I, I guess the biggest, yes, that's, that's a huge blessing. The biggest impact is helping me to, um, be more sympathetic, to be more understanding, to understand where people are coming from. Um, very early on, I was always the girl that people were sharing their problems with. Um, it was common when I was in my 20s for women that were twice older than me uh, would be telling me stuff. Um, and like, I've never told anyone this. So all I ever knew as a young person is I want to help people. I just didn't know what that looked like. And so it through my whole life, I have always had some form of mentoring people, uh, discipling, we would call it coaching now. Um, but meeting with people on a regular basis. And so having this um, trauma in my life, I think really helped me to understand where people are coming from in a way that I would not have otherwise. Yeah, I, again, I can identify with that. You know, and the people wanting to come to you and tell you what's going on, because they feel like you're a safe person for them. Mm -hmm. Did you all of your mentoring you wanted to hide from it you were kind of pushing it away like no that's I, I don't want to do that but you kept getting called uh I don't know that I hid so much but I didn't take care of myself in the process um I put everybody else's needs above my own would be more what I did and yeah. um until you break <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> until your body says you're stopping. Um, and emotionally too, if, uh, I carried their pain in a way of didn't know how to, how I was, I was so young. I didn't know the right way to, to, to do it without taking it all personally and carrying everybody's load. So those are some skills that I have learned, um, along the way. That is for sure. <laughs> yes. And really important ones to have too. I mean, that's, that's a powerful tool bag. Yes, it is. What helped you to heal from everything that you had gone through? Mm. The biggest thing for me, since this is my story, was my relationship with God. Um, being, remember, the 15-year-old little girl with absolutely no one. And I had a relationship with God. And that was the only person I had to talk to. So I learned how to, uh, without someone telling me how, I learned how to forgive. I learned how to begin to release, uh, forgiving myself and all that process. <laughs> <laughs> but learning how to let go and not um, hold on to the bitterness and anger and fear and frustration and all of those uh, things. Letting go of self-doubt took a little longer too, um, but learning how to, that was the biggest impact because I truly didn't have anything or anyone. Wow. And it's so important that we do have God in our lives. I mean, I'm, I'm a Christian myself and often speak about that on the podcast, even though I interview people from all different kind of faith mm -hmm. backgrounds. Um, it's, it's really, it's super important to understand uh, that 
what forgiveness is too. A lot of yes. people believe that forgiveness means telling somebody that what they did to you is okay, even when it's not. Correct. You know, how would you interpret forgiveness? Well, forgiveness is a huge what do I do in my coaching practice with my turn your baggage into luggage program. And how do we turn our baggage into something that could be used for good, that could come, something good can come out of it. And you can't do it without forgiveness. And it's one of the most misunderstood uh, statements. First of all, forgiveness is not a feeling because I need to wait till I feel like it. <laughs> I've got to right. feel, feel like I'm ready. I got to feel like I'm ready. I got to get ready. Um, and what actually happens is forgiveness is a choice of your will and your emotions will catch up. But you say you begin to forgive first and then your emotions heal. It's not the other way around. And we often that. think that, or it means like, it's okay. They're not even sorry, right? Why would I forgive them? They've right. never apologized. And if I got close enough, they do it again, or they have done it again. Um, right. All of those things are what people say about forgiveness. They're not even sorry. It, it, it's not right. I'm saying that what they did is okay. They're going to get away with it. All of those things are truly what we feel. Um, injustice, all of those emotions. I had all of those, all of them. And learning how to, that forgiveness, uh, one of the keys, I'm going to let you in on a secret. One yeah. of the keys I learned about forgiveness is using it the image of an onion. Because when there's serious trauma, forgiveness is in layers. For example, if you're just, it just occurred, or you're just starting this journey, you forgive where you can today. And then you let it go to the best of your ability with, and I help people with this every day, and move on. And then somewhere down the road, it seems to stir up again. People use the word triggered. All of a sudden, you're feeling all these ugly emotions all over again. And you're like, oh, I thought I forgave. What's wrong with me? Am I ever going to get over this? Take a breath. This is what I'm talking about. An onion. You, you, you forgave on the first layer. You cried. You let it go. And now you're ready. God believes you're ready to go a little deeper that you're stronger, you've healed. And so you forgive a different layer and then you move on. And it might be multiple layers depending upon what happened to you. But learning how to not judge yourself and beat yourself up for your journey, but to embrace it and allow yourself time to do the best you can at the place you are with support, of course. What a beautiful process. I mean, it totally makes sense too. I mean, if you break down the basics of the trauma stages, yes. you go into denial, anger, bargaining, depression, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. acceptance. Just because you're in one of those doesn't mean that you're not going to bounce back and forth between the others. And right. forgiveness is exactly the same way. Yep. You're going to feel different things at different hours of every day. That's just the way it is. You know, and being able to forgive somebody has nothing to do with them. Yeah, I, uh, um, I'm going from comparing myself to that young, scared little girl to now a woman who is leading an international ministry, helping women around the world to step in and heal from their past so that they can be who God created them to be. And I took a trip um, quite a few years back now back to my home and something there triggered me mm. and I woke up from a complete sleep. I was a, a, sobbing in it. So I thought I was asleep and I crying woke me up. And uh, one of those where, you know, really ugly cries where you're, yeah. you're shaking and your guts feel like they're coming out and all of that kind of yuckiness and, and it took me a while. I cried for a while. And I'm like, okay, God, what is going on? And he said, you're grieving the little girl who never had a voice. Oh. And, and I am mad because I'm like, at that point, it was like 
almost 40 years ago, this happened. And I'm like, this is 40 years. Do I, I'm like, why? And so then you want to get mad at yourself. Like I'm talking about, I did all of this. I'm, I walked this out and I'm like, okay, I've got to hold this together while I'm here. I'll get home and call my coach and we'll work through this. And she gave me some steps to work through to love that little girl and help her to heal. And so that was another freeing thing that, and it's caught, it, I mean, it caught me totally off guard. I was asleep. But these kind of things can occur. And when we have the right support and walk through, they can be amazing, not easy, but amazing to set myself even freer and heal more. Wow. I don't think I've ever told anyone that story. So that's a new one. Oh, wow. I feel <laughs> honored. Thank you for sharing that, Donna. That's, that is amazing. What a beautiful moment for God to say, you need this moment. Mm -hmm. you know, this, is, this is part of your journey. It's part of your healing. I think a lot of people want to say to themselves, that was so long ago. I shouldn't mm -hmm. feel like mm -hmm. this anymore. And I tell mm -hmm. people all the time, don't should all over yourself. Yep. Um, the should doesn't belong in your vo vocabulary as often mm -hmm. as it's there. Right. Yeah. So in your, in your journey, in what you're doing now, um, can you think of one of the most think that, that just comes to mind that happens to be super impactful where somebody said that you made a difference for them? Yeah, it happened yesterday. <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> um, is another woman and, uh, for whatever reason, she's really never told me her story, but I know there was sexual trauma as a child. Um, and uh, we have been working together for a little while and we we're on a Zoom call yesterday and she breaks down crying and she says, Donna, you have no, I need you to know today what an impact you've made in my life. She said, you cut your words come to mind when I need them. In the beginning, it was, oh my God, help. And now I'm just filled with gratitude because I'm beginning to live a life I would love, which I call vibrant living. And it's, I absolutely love my life. And I can't even imagine the difference between when I met you to today. Wow. Um, and so that I, and I have that on video. <laughs> I probably won't ever share it because it was so personal for her journey, but it, that happened yesterday. Oh my gosh. That is cool. That is cool. And your website is ivibrantliving.com. Yes, it is. Right. And that's where people can go to find out more about your speaking and coaching. And you've written yes. three books. Yes. Um, <laughs> and if people want to grab one of your books, what are they called and where would they typically go? Uh, one of them is free on my homepage and it's called An Umbrella on a Sunny Day. And that title came from how we always prepare for the other shoe to drop kind of an attitude. Yes. For example, it's sunny outside, but I know it's going to rain on me sooner or later. So I'm bringing my umbrella today. Oh. Um, and so that book is more about my personal story and it gives you four keys to leave your umbrella at home and enjoy the sunshine. Um, as for, as well as other women's stories are included. So, and then I have another book under my resource tab, and this one is to purchase. It's called the key to transform your life. And it is a book of why the words we speak are important as well as 30 days of affirmations or declarations to say, and they're not any one of them the same. So you're not, you're not being bored. You have something new every day to find the ones that really feel impactful to you. And that is available on my website to purchase. Very cool. Uh, and I'm going to be actually doing a reading from an umbrella on a sunny day later on in the episode. Um, I'm excited to read this one. And I want to read the other one too, of course. But an umbrella on a sunny day, there's just something about it that's so appealing. The cover is a bright yellow umbrella with other umbrellas being tossed up in the air around it. It's just, it looks bright and sunny but at the same time questionable what what is this <laughs> and i don't know if you've noticed this or not and you have a question mark at the end of the book title an umbrella on a sunday day question mark mm. 
the handle of every umbrella in the image is an upside down question mark. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) There's so much symbolism there. (laughs) And the title makes, makes you wonder what's that mean? Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And I've got links to your speaker bio, your LinkedIn, your Facebook, your Instagram, your YouTube. You are all over the place. You're on Twitter. I need to do all this following now, but I'm also going to be including all these links and stuff in the podcast description so other people can follow along and learn more about you and about what it is that that you do. But in the meantime, what is one thing that you wish that people knew about you, but they never seem to understand until you tell them? Hmm. I'm good at the tough questions today. So am I. <laughs> Um, I, I, I recognize it. (laughs) Uh, Probably how much I care until they experience that. That's not something someone would know just by meeting me. Um, and sometimes, uh, caring means calling them on their stuff. (laughs) Yes. Um, true love doesn't let us get away with things that will hurt us. And so, um, but I think that's one thing is understanding how deeply, how deeply I love and care for people. That's pretty cool. I don't, I don't know. I'm looking at your photo on your website and I kind of get that sense from you. (laughs) I, I think I would pick up on that pretty quickly. You have caring, very sweet and gentle face where you just look like somebody that I would want to walk up to and have a conversation with. No, thank you. I appreciate that. So who is your hero? Who do you look up to? Mm. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is God. That's always my focus. Um, I don't really look to man a whole lot to people. Um, I learn from them. I admire them. Um, Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, one person that I follow is Tony Robbins, had some um, programs and certifications with him. Um, but there's a lot of others. Amazing. Lisa Nichols is another one that I follow. Um, so there's amazing people. But my primary source is always God. Do you have a favorite book of the Bible? No. No, just all of them, right? (laughs) No, I don't have a favorite book. I have favorite verses probably. Um, And it, they been depending upon what is needed in my life at the moment. Um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, got me through some really rough uh, periods of time, but there is so many promises. Um, Jeremiah 29, 11, the plans I have for you are for good, to prosper you, to give you hope and a future. Um, there are so many. Oh, I, I love it when somebody like you just knows exactly where to <laughs> flip to in the Bible to find that encouraging word that somebody out there needs. I want to so. be a messenger of hope. There is always hope when you know where to look. And another big thing is, is we, whenever we've been injured, we tend to isolate and we try to do it alone. Um, Please don't do that. Find the right resources. I am here. There's lots of people that have a, have a conversation with someone and get some support. Don't try to do it alone. Um, it's It's so much wiser to get help. It's scary trying to do it alone too. It is. It is. And, and I totally get it. I mean, you're a trauma survivor. You're out there in the world. You're feeling like nobody else is ever going to understand what you've been through or what you're going through. But that's just not the case. There is no such thing as a new injury. You're no. never alone, no matter what it is that you've gone through. <clears throat> no, it's, to, to me, what I've seen is it's, it's not feeling that nobody else has, but it's who can I trust? Yeah. Um, the trust is a big deal. So, um, but anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the things that I go through in one of my books is talking about, you know, use this 
cons list to be able to figure out who your safe people are going to be to talk mm-hmm. to about mm-hmm. what it is that you've been through. It needs to be appropriate, but it also needs to be safe. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That was important stuff. Well, I need to make sure that I leave enough time for me to uh, do a quick reading of your book. So I'm going to have to ask you my one last question, but it is my favorite question of the whole episode and always will be. What is one thing that you love about yourself that's not related to your physical appearance? Hmm. Again, with the tough questions. Mm. (laughs) I like the pausing because it means we're really thinking. We're not just giving a quick answer. Um, I think it's my resilience. Um. And I also love the gift that God has given me of being very intuitive. Um, I can see the root of the problem almost immediately. And and so being able to move quickly through those kind of things, those are some things that I'm pretty proud about myself. There's a lot there to be proud of. God's done a lot of work in you. Amen. Amen. Stay tuned for a quick reading. I'm going to offer a short reading from Donna's book, An Umbrella on a Sunny Day. I'm actually going to skip over to chapter two, which is called Stumbling Block Number One. This is a very important chapter, I feel. It talks about being that yes person always wanting to please others, being a people pleaser. For those who aren't aware, this is a trauma reaction. And it's really cool that she's outlined this with a personal story to really bring it home and make it relevant. Stumbling block number one, yes person. We all have a basic need for love and belonging. As we try to meet this need, we can begin to say yes to everything. As a yes person, I was in a constant state of trying to keep everyone happy. If I think about it today, I wanted to be loved and accepted. So if I do enough, maybe that will happen. Which leads me to another story. On a cold winter day in upstate New York, my pastor asked me to come into his office for a short meeting. This was a normal occurrence as I volunteered in the office and had volunteered at some point in almost every department at the church. A little background, at that time I was an executive director for the nonprofit organization called Love Inc., which I founded in the Tri-City area of the capital of New York. This position required me to oversee thousands of volunteers in hundreds of churches. I also oversaw all the fundraising, office volunteers, agency relationships, church relationships, and events. Our office generated millions of dollars in kind services to those in need in our community. I also had my three beautiful children ranging in ages from 5 to 14 years old. Like most kids that age, they had extracurricular activities on regular occurrences. My hardworking husband worked about 50 to 60 hours a week at UPS in management, and I took care of everything else. I was running ragged, out of breath, overwhelmed. When trying to sleep, my mind continued to make a list of things I needed to do and was afraid that I would forget. Missing shoes, homework assignments, and a very moody teenager kept me on my toes. When all alone, I would collapse into tears. But of course, no one knew this. I was a superwoman who just got everything done. Now back to the meeting. This did turn out to be an unusual meeting. My pastor said, Donna, I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and for each question, I want you to answer me with no. Yes, that's correct. I want you to tell me no. As he began to ask me to do tasks, I felt this very strange. I I couldn't seem to get the word no out of my mouth. It was like it was stuck in my throat. As I began to whisper the word no, he patiently continued to ask me another question until I began to tell him no. As I did, my voice became more confident and strong. That day was pivotal for me. 
I did not fully realize until that moment that I was trying to take care of everyone and everything in my entire world and hadn't told anyone no. I didn't think it was allowed or acceptable. Trying to please everyone is exhausting and overwhelming. I recognized that I did not have any breathing room to take care of me. Once again, you can get this free download book, An Umbrella on a Sunny Day, at Donna Tashjan's website, which is ivibrantliving.com. Thank you, and I'll see you next time. If you've enjoyed tonight's episode, please make sure you check out the episode description. You'll find links there on how you can learn more about this guest, links to connect with them on social media, and how to support the podcast. Remember, I don't get paid to do this. My boss is a bit tight-fisted, but I can say that. I work for myself. In short, this show really is all about the guest. If you've enjoyed their interview, please feel free to let them know. You can also tune in to the other podcast, Growth from Darkness, which is co-hosted by a lovely lady from Australia. We talk about what trauma responses are and healthy ways to move beyond the past. For more information, just go to growthfromdarkness.com. Mm-hmm.